fish that require more, like striped bass, the anchovy, and the clams, aren't going to be able to survive in this environment because there's not, there's not enough oxygen for them to breathe. Education about the water, on the water. See how this million dollar barge is launching a new era of learning, and it's anchored here in Hampton Roads. This is What Matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. There's a new wave of learning, so to speak, about our waterways, specifically the Elizabeth River. This major estuary is a vital artery into the heart of Hampton Roads military and commercial ports, and it runs between Portsmouth and Norfolk. For years now, the focus has been on cleaning it up. Now there's a new classroom that's taking young people right to the water's edge. Lisa Godley shows us a new generation of environmental education. Sail. But that isn't keeping her from putting smiles on the faces of the region's school children. And the best part? While these youngsters play games, conduct experiments, and create art. Pull! Oh, great pull. Thank you guys. They're learning. So, what we have here is our list of species. And on this side, this is the amount of oxygen they need in the water in order to survive. So, what was our reading again? Look at our board. What, what, is, what was that reading? 4.1. Four 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 yes. And so that means fish that require more, like striped bass, the anchovy, and the clams, aren't going to be able to survive in this environment because there's not, there's not enough oxygen for them to breathe. Docked on the waterfront in downtown Portsmouth, the Learning Barge is the world's first floating classroom, offering students of all ages a way to examine the Elizabeth River up close. The barge was launched in mid-September by the Elizabeth River Project, a nonprofit group determined to make the river, once a dumping ground for industry, both fishable and swimmable by 2020. When you come aboard, I hope that you will learn the majesty and majesticness of the Elizabeth River, and I also hope that each of you will learn how to make the Elizabeth River swimmable and fishable by 2020. As these youngsters quickly found out, one of the best ways to learn about what's in the river is to catch it. What are these guys? Blue crab. Blue crab. Blue crab. Don't live, just me. What else is in there? There's something else Ooh, in there. That's a spider crab. That's a spider crab. Yeah, that's a spider crab. Oh, that was right here. There are six stations on board, each one designed to teach visitors about the river while informing them of what they can do to help restore its environmental health. Okay. The storm drain is the major polluter of our river here. Everything that goes in these storm drains goes right into the river, okay? So we will... I learned that um, when you're a dog, when he uses the bathroom on the ground, you, um, you need to pick it up. What happens if you don't pick it up? Um, it goes into the water. For school-aged visitors, activities cover five different standards of learning. That's algae. algae. If you take your hats off, you can see what these That's algae what look like. Turtle lake. What do you do? That's what algae actually looks like underneath a microscope. That's you that green stuff you catch on your While this floating classroom will certainly see its share of students on field trips, it's designed to be a teaching tool for students of all ages. Anyone who wants to learn how to make the Elizabeth River both fishable and swimmable by 2020. The floating classroom goes in for winterization at the end of the month. But if you haven't had an opportunity to see all she has to offer, have no fear. The Learning Barge will be back in April of 2010. For What Matters, I'm Lisa Godley. Well, a great idea. We're glad to have with us Marjorie Mayfield Jackson. She is the executive director of the Elizabeth River Project and also with us tonight from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Hampton Roads science advocate Chris Moore. Welcome and thanks to both of you for joining us tonight. Thank you nice to have us. you here. Great to what be a here. great project. And tell us how it, how it was conceived and how it came together. Well, we're really excited about it. It really exceeded all our expectations. We wanted a compelling new way to engage everybody, all ages, in what they could do to help make the Elizabeth River safer swimming and fishing. 
and we wanted it to be a mobile field station that we could take into the communities and we wanted to symbolize that this is a port river mm -hmm. and it's taking back its life as a living ecosystem so what better way than a barge which symbolizes yeah. the port sure. having a living wetland on board and having learning stations for students and adults I thought it was interesting too to, talk, to, to watch the children's reaction to this and I was talking with uh, Bev Sell from the Five Points Farm Market and she was saying uh, you know a lot of children or some children at least uh, do not understand the concept that potatoes are grown in the ground you know and and they're not close to their food supply and so I I was watching that video the in Lisa's terrific report thinking about there must also be a lot of children who don't make that connection either about what comes out of the water right well there's a huge disconnection around the world really between children and the environment yes. today and especially with this particular river which is so industrialized such a hardened shore it's very hard for most of us to really touch the elizabeth river and so with the learning barge the children get to actually go out on the river and it's kind of neat that it's not moving it's just stationed yeah. so that they can enjoy the, the learning stations but Four or five times every time they have a field trip, they have to stop because some huge vessel will be coming by for the port. Oh, isn't so, that interesting? So, you know, right when they're pulling up these fish yeah. and learning it's a living river, they're also seeing that it's an economic artery. Boy, that's great. It's I mean, really, it's, it's a very powerful statement of I that, think isn't it? it? Is. Yeah. And, and so we're looking at cleaning the Elizabeth River and making it uh, swimmable and fishable by 2020. That's a big job. It is, and that's why we really needed to raise our profile in the community. We really needed new recruiting stations. Mm -hmm. Our goal is 25,000 citizen soldiers who know how to do their part and are committed to it. And what would be their part? Everything from reducing your fertilizer, which is going to wash into the river and lead to the algae problems mm -hmm. and the fish kills, to, like the little boy said, scooping the poop yeah. so that you're not contributing to the bacteria that makes the river unsafe for swimming. So you really are trying to reach out in the community and let people know this is not just about those corporate citizens, although they've done a terrific job, the River Star program along the river, but it's right. also about what each right. of us right. can do as well. Right. It's a very parallel message to uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in terms of, of size and scope and, and initiative. So give us a sense, Chris, of how Chesapeake Bay Foundation relates to the Elizabeth River project? Well, I, I think the health of all the tributaries that end up flowing in the Chesapeake Bay is really going to be the driver for the overall health of the bay in the future. Um, the watershed groups like the Elizabeth River project that are working on smaller bodies of water, making a difference, making the water quality in those waterways better, educating the citizenry so that they make better decisions in their communities uh, will improve the water quality in those tributaries and that will eventually give us the water quality improvements we're seeking yeah. within the Chesapeake Bay as a whole. Your job is described as a science advocate. What does that right. mean? Well, I think uh, most of the time using the, the sciences out there to advocate for positions that uh, promote uh, better activities throughout the watershed to protect bay's health, to protect uh, management of fisheries that are in Chesapeake Bay, and, and really to connect the management decisions that we make with how they affect species on the ground or activities in the watershed. I think it's so interesting too when you look at something like the Chesapeake Bay project where there is a uh, foundation where there, you know, you really are a multi-state initiative and of course different states have different rules and bodies of water don't stay in the states where they right. originate I mean it's a and, and the, the geographies and the topographies vary so much throughout the state right. obviously here in Hampton Roads uh, we work with uh, industrial type dischargers we're working on land use decisions and things like that however we spend a lot of our time working in the Shenandoah Valley with agricultural mm. operations because those small streams that transect farms and areas like that are really the the start of the Chesapeake Bay and the start of the Chesapeake Bay wow. watershed so yeah. we've got to make changes out there as well. As you think, you mentioned land use, and that's just such an interesting point on so many levels. What would you like to see in terms of land use that would make a difference in terms of the Chesapeake Bay? I think just being smarter about our land use. I think uh, developing in ways where we don't build as much impervious surface when we do build buildings and, and uh, ho housing and things like that. Um, thinking about our transit system in a way that we don't have to build so many road miles right. to connect during uh, to connect to the, to the uh, places of employment. Uh, if you look at the last couple of years, 
although our population has grown uh, at about an 8% clip, the amount of impervious surface has gone up over 30%. So Impervious we, surface, you know, what, roads? Roadways, yeah. um, basically hard surfaces where instead of rainwater um, infiltrating into the ground, oh, it flows across the hard surface, carrying those pollutants right into either the bay or a tributary like the Elizabeth River or even a smaller tributary. Yeah. Yeah. I think that land use thing is so interesting because it really points up this interconnectedness of the whole thing. And so many people, I think, haven't quite put that together. The, the idea that uh, land use is related to uh, the management of the waterways and then where we get our food and how we get our food is also a piece of this uh, issue as well. Absolutely. Um, we like to believe that when you catch fish from the Elizabeth River, it would be just fine to eat them. Mm -hmm. But in fact, all of our land use practices over the years have made it not so great yeah. to eat very many of them. And of course, we have this uh, great project, the, the Lindhaven. I mean, what a success story that's been. Yeah, that's very exciting and very encouraging to the rest of us that we can do this. Yeah. Uh, what, was, what made the Lindhaven restoration successful? I think one of the things is it, it's been such a partnership between organizations like Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Lynn Haven River Now, the City of Virginia Beach, and then the citizenry to make changes in their everyday life that uh, improve water quality. And then there's been the restoration efforts to build, rebuild oyster reefs, to build the habitat that was there. And then there's been efforts to stock those oyster reefs by CBF and other organizations so that uh, in addition to just putting the oysters out there to help filter the water, we're reducing the pollutant load that's coming in mm -hmm. and therefore the water body can actually assimilate that and we can see real gains yeah. and strides in, in And we are in fact seeing gains and strides. I mean, I think that's the thing that's so tough about this is that when you ask the average person, when the average person stands at the edge of the water and looks out at something as magnificent as the Bay or the Elizabeth River or the Lafayette, it's kind of hard to imagine what you could do to affect change. And it's a daunting issue, but you really have been able to track change and improvement. We track it both in acres, like our River Star Industries have created a thousand acres of urban wildlife habitat and reduced their pollution voluntarily by 200 million pounds of pollution. So by results of stewardship mm -hmm. in acres and pounds and by improvement in, in water quality, the, the health of the Elizabeth River has been improving steadily over the years. There's still some daunting challenges, but we're beginning to get a handle on them. And so we, to break this down into more manageable goals, you've got a particular project in the Lafayette. We have a new project in the Lafayette. Um, we are working with Chesapeake Bay Foundation in a, in a new partnership and the citizens there and the city of Norfolk and a lot of other partners that come up with a specific plan for the Lafayette to make hmm. it swimmable and fishable even sooner than our big goal to make it swimmable and fishable by 2014. And we'll be announcing that plan, we hope, in the spring uh -huh. with a lot of enthusiasm. Working out all the details now. Yes, yeah. indeed. But um, we already have some significant grant funding that we'll be talking about and some on-the-ground projects. Yeah. So I think it's going to be very exciting. That's the, the other piece of that I think that's interesting is there's so much residential along the Lafayette that you really do have an opportunity to engage so many people who live along, uh, who live at the water's edge. And boy, isn't that a marvelous feature of this region that you, you have so much better possibility of living on or near the water here than you do in many other parts of the country. No question about it. Do you have the sense, uh, Chris, that these, this message is getting through to the individual, I mean, we've talked a lot about how we get this to a corporate community and mm -hmm. that corporate citizens certainly are getting on board. Do you have the sense that individuals are as well? I, I think so, and, and I think a lot of how it's getting to individuals, though, is the programs like the Learning Barge and like our education programs here in, in Hampton Roads as well. It's the students who come out to these type of events right. that then go home and ask their parents to make a change here or a change there, and then the parents look a little bit more into it, and it starts and, and the, gets the ball rolling. Yeah. And, and I mean, it was our children who taught us how to recycle, right? Right, I mean, exactly. You know. I, and I think uh, you know things that are happening now, like with uh, uh, using reusable bags, I think is something, again, that has kind of started with educating the children about it, and the parents have started to take that over. And uh, we hope now that, as Margie alluded to earlier, some of the things like maybe not fertilizing your lawn so much, because obviously the kids aren't doing that, but they learn about it on these various educational experiences, mm -hmm. are beginning to move up yeah. the... Uh, the uh, ladder. Up the age, up, up the, the age, age ladder. Chain. That's right. <laughs> That's true. Uh, it's interesting because I note that uh, in, in North Carolina, you know, they passed that law in the la their last General Assembly that had to do with the plastic bags. And I think it's only stores of a certain size uh, where they basically banned these plastic bags that find their way into the waterways uh, so often. Uh, from a legislative perspective, do you see uh, legislation that will help further these efforts that might have an impact on consumers? 
or, no, you, or is that really not your focus? I, that's not a, as big a focus for us. Uh -huh. I, our focus has continued to be uh, on nutrient pollution Got in it. the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. Uh, I, I think you will continue to see, though, um, probably some efforts similar to that in Virginia um, because they are such a visual sure. reminder of pollution. Now, it's, yeah. it's not maybe the, the source that CBF is focused on at this time, but again, it's one of those first steps that people make to start connecting the dots. Sure. And, uh, live with less impact on the watershed. They say 25% of shorebirds have plastic bags in their stomachs. So they, they do, wow. if they get in the water, they look like jellyfish and the marine life tends to eat them and then they can actually starve to death. So it is part of our action plan to try to reduce their use. Sure. But, but we turn, tend to go kind of the voluntary way and just yes. encourage people right now we're not. Yeah. And that seems to work very well too, doesn't it? I mean, you really are so able to far. get people on board with it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, I remember um, recently I had the opportunity to go out on the Chesapeake Bay uh, in some of the tributaries to look at some of the, the terrific work that uh, the Bay Foundation is doing in terms of the oyster restoration and, and the rest of it. Uh, you're really trying to expand that. Yes. Uh, not only expand, but also make sure we do it in a very targeted manner so it's successful, yes. like it was in the uh, Lynn Haven River. Right. Um, right now, we're doing a lot of work in the Pancatank River. Uh, we have some partners up there um, that has made it a very good partnership, and we've been focusing up there for the last couple of years now. And uh, after, in about two more years, we'll see more yeah. of those efforts now focused uh, on the Lafayette, as um, Marjorie alluded to, uh, to work in water bodies that we know we can make a difference. Mm. In, um, and therefore efforts will be successful and people, as we talked about earlier, can walk down and see a difference. Uh, if right. you go to the Lynn Haven now, you can walk down and if you walk down to the shoreline 15 years ago, you didn't see oysters along the shoreline. Sure enough. And now you see yeah. clusters and clusters of oysters along yeah. the shoreline and they're sitting there filtering the water every day. Uh, that, that's a good thing. And we have these uh, marvelous opportunities for individuals to get involved in this as well when it comes to oyster restoration. Absolutely, and many other areas. Um, our website now has a menu of the best things that you can do to mm. clean up the Elizabeth River and mm -hmm. pretty much detailed whatever one you want to pick or we hope you pick them all. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, we have some video of uh, Bay Education, certainly the, the, the Luring Barge is a big, a big part of that Bay Education. But as you think about that, that issue, do you have the sense um, that, that children are picking this up and that the teachers, because I guess that's the first piece, you have to get to the teachers to, to teach them what to teach, don't you? We have a teacher workshop coming up, uh -huh. and we got three times the interest that we had room really? for. Really? That's fantastic. And the teachers are really just eating up the field trips to the learning barge. Yeah. We're booked solid for the whole year, just about. I mean, I don't want to discourage teachers from calling because sure, maybe we course. can still fit yeah. them in. But we're booking into next year. Yeah. So That's fantastic. And the boat we just saw was a Chesapeake Bay Foundation boat out the, on the... The B. Hayman Clark out yes, on the yes. Haven. Yeah, and and uh, and so same kind of goal there to take people out and really let them see what's going on. on exactly, the and uh, take kid, we, primarily we take students out. Uh, we take over uh, 2,500 students out in the area uh, each year. But uh, much like uh, mm -hmm. Marjorie mentioned, we also have a professional development program for teachers. It's primarily during the summer, and uh, to teach. Uh, those teachers about the materials that are there to teach them about the resource so they yeah. can take that back and touch the children that maybe don't get out sure. on, the, on the waterways. And that's such a good point because there are children who don't have that opportunity which is another reason why the learning barge and these boats make such sense to connect young people uh, with the water that's gosh so very much a part of our economy and our lifestyle here in Hampton Roads. Um, are there SOLs connected to these issues? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a string of SOLs that's taught in each of the six learning stations. And we had an advisory committee of teachers and science coordinators who developed our curriculum with us to make sure. Oh, we that's were great. Which also that. probably makes a difference for a teacher that. Absolutely, to be able to justify sure. bringing the children. Yeah. And, and they're saying this is really helping them meet their SOLs. Good, good. Well, you know, that's, the, that's one of the. Field trips are wonderful things, and kids learn all kinds of things. It's kind of a shame that you have to make those kinds of connections for every single thing. But you have to do it, so you have to do it, right? I mean, you just you just kind of get it done. Um, has the River Star program expanded over the years? Because I know in the beginning you just had a couple, and then it started growing. Absolutely, quite a lot. it's more popular every year. We have 69 industries participating. That's fantastic. And, um, each year, more of them are documenting their results, which are, are all above and beyond the law. Yeah. So we're really excited about that. That's terrific. And of course, CBF is partnering with organizations, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, partnering with organizations like the Elizabeth River Project and other partners. Right. 
We, we have a very uh, healthy partnership with Lynn Haven River now. Uh, we've been uh, partnering with uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, up in uh, the Eastern Shore and in the Botanic Tank River for oyster restoration work. Mm -hmm. um, we, we really have made an effort to partner with as many of what we call small watershed groups as we right. can because building that synergy is really going to be the key to solving some of these environmental issues and water quality issues in the future. Yeah, and it's very interesting because we've spent a lot of years sort of looking at industrial polluters and that certainly is a, a very very key piece of it, but I don't think until recent years we've really begun to look at the role that each of us individually can right, play right. and can have an impact. You it, know? It, exactly. I, I think now you've seen some uh, stormwater regulations start to move through Virginia and that gets at the, the piece that we play every day. Mm -hmm. uh, agriculture is another part that CBF has worked uh, very hand in hand with the agriculture community because those smaller operations um, really play a part in the help of those smaller waterways they, that they're located on. Boy, no kidding. Uh, we're talking with Chris Moore, who's a science advocate for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and Marjorie Mayfield Jackson, who's the executive director of the Elizabeth River Project. As you think about this role of science education for children, one of the things we know internationally is that comparatively we struggle uh, in science and in the science and math arenas. Uh, do you have the sense that we're doing what we need to do from the perspective of, of training children to be well-rounded uh, citizens who really have an understanding of what their impact is? I mean, do you have the sense that from a, a legislative perspective or from a public policy perspective, these kinds of activities are, are upheld, what you're trying to accomplish here? Well, I think it's really encouraging the emphasis that we see today in getting children outside. Mm -hmm. A meaningful watershed experience is an accepted goal for the state, for mm -hmm. the local educators um, around the Bay and a real effort to fund those and encourage those and allow teachers to, to make uh, all use of those. Yeah. And the Learning Budget would be a great example. Indeed. So what's the website for the Elizabeth River Project? How could people get in touch to learn what they might be sure. able to do? Sure, elizabethriver.org oh, and 399-7487. Yeah. And so if you have an organization that's interested in uh, perhaps doing some oyster uh, bed restoration, you could certainly call them and get some information on how to do that. If you as an individual want to know more about what your impact is and how to uh, moderate that, uh, that is a great way to go. Chris Moore, how about for Chesapeake Bay Foundation? Our website here is cbf.org. Um org. Uh, our local phone number here is 757-622-1961. And same deal there. Lots of opportunities lots of for opportunities people to get involved. Get involved, right. Yeah, well, congratulations to both of you. I think uh, the work that you do is, is, is daunting, but it's really making a difference. And every one of these reports that comes out indicates we make a little bit of progress at a time. So maybe... Maybe if you're watching this broadcast, you'll be inspired to find out what you can do. And the truth of the matter is, the great truth is that we all have a lot to do with it. And there are small changes that we can make that will make a big difference. I'll be back in a moment with a final thought. The learning barge had lots of help getting into the water. University of Virginia students spent the summer in Chesapeake working on the project, and a local shipyard donated the space and installed a fair amount of the equipment on the barge. According to the Virginian pilot, some of the students had already graduated, some of those UVA students, but they flew back to town to be there for the dedication. Scott Harper writes the project has already won several national awards, including a creative design competition by the Environmental Protection Agency and the top educational honor last year from the American Institute of Architects. You know, in journalism, we talk about the five W's, the who, the what, the when, the why, and the where. And there's one big H we talk about as well, and that's the how. Well, the how in this case, as it is in so many nonprofit cases, was painstaking efforts to get money and services from 50 different sponsors. It's companies like Lowe's and Dominion Virginia Power that help drive the nonprofit organizations that are mending the holes in the increasingly frayed social safety net. And so the next time you're invited to a charity auction or a fundraising event, Take a look at the names of the corporate sponsors who help deliver these events and do business with them. And when you're at these charity events, don't think just because there's a $50 gift certificate there that it's not a deal if you have to pay 60 for it. There's a reason you pay 60 for it, because it all goes back to the organization. And of course, when you do the math, what you paid for your ticket just about covers basic expenses. It covers your, your snacks, maybe your beverages. 
but it is the sponsorships and the gifts of good corporate citizens that drive so much that is good about living in Hampton Road. So it's important to take a look at those companies that give their names and their dollars and their goods and services to charity organizations that make this community run, and then to go out and support those organizations as well. Well, if you'd like to watch this program again, I hope you'll join us online at whatmatters.tv. Of course, you can also download our audio and video podcasts through iTunes. Next week, we will look at the changing workplace. We'll check out the best places to work in Hampton Roads. And boy, there are lots of reasons that make them the best places to work. Some very innovative things going on in workplaces throughout this region. So we'll give you a look at that next week. Don't forget on the radio, tune in for Hearsay on WHRV FM 89.5, and we'd love to have you as part of that conversation live each weekday at noon as well. Thanks for watching. I'm Kathy Lewis, and we'll see you next time for another look at What Matters.